feed a growing world population. So together, um, we brought experts today to talk about the what kinds of changes that need to come about uh, on the current way that we work the land and um, technologies that we use, and also what could a global agriculture look like in the future. So we do, we want to focus on how advancements in science and technology can contribute to the modern um, future of agriculture, but we also want to look at how this can be integrated with the current farming approaches we have. So before we start, uh, I just want to do some housekeeping to make uh, sure we, everything runs smoothly. So could we all, um, if you're not a host, please make sure your camera and your mic are off. This will help with bandwidth problems and hopefully stop any videos um, pausing or freezing up. And secondly, uh, we, all are, we are also going to ask you to use the Q&A function today. This will, hope, uh, this will help us sift through the questions a bit easier, make sure we've answered everybody's questions and without missing anything out. And you can find this Q&A function. It's on the little um, activities tab at the bottom of your screen, um, circled in red here. And if you press that, it'll come up and then go to the Q&A section and we can type, you can type directly in there, just like a chat box. Um, any other general questions or messages to the chat, any issues you're having, please try and post it into the general chat. Um, but if, if all else fails, just put it in the general chat and we'll try and pick up on things. So um, without, after all that's out of the way, um, please let me know now if you've got any issues and we'll try and get them sorted. But uh, I'll go on to who's speaking and um, who's chairing today. So uh, chairing today, we have Toby Evans, one of the group. He's, um, his research is in hydroponic uh, farming production and has a general focus of sustainable agriculture and, and our experts, and he will give a more detailed view of all the experts today as well. But our experts today are Aaron Redman from the Innovation of Agriculture, Panvir Khan from the Intelligent Growth Solutions and Doug Kemp from Regather. So without further ado, Toby, all yours. All right, thank you very much, Sophia. Um, so, we're going to start off with a little bit of uh, background, a uh, bit of exposition. Um, so, food production and agriculture uh, have a huge potential to be the causes and solutions to many of the issues the world is currently facing and, and will face in the future. Um, globally, this produces around a third of all carbon emissions uh, and is responsible for rapid deterioration and loss of soils deforestation, as well as uh, pollution uh, from a reliance on synthetic fertilizers, uh, all impacting on ecosystems and biodiversity on a mass scale. Um, however, uh, we all need to eat, uh, and there are more and more of us than ever, uh, with food demand expected to increase by 35% to 56% uh, between 2010 and 2050. So how can we fill these needs uh, whilst minimizing the impact uh, that we have on the planet and provide sustainable solutions that give us the environmental, societal and economic security? Not an easy question uh, to answer, uh, but I hope that some of the discussions that we have today uh, can shed some light on some of the approaches uh, that have potential to make big differences to the way that we think about food and its production, uh, as well as the impact that it's having on the planet uh, and society. So zooming in on the UK, um, there are a multitude of challenges sort of facing the sector. Um, Labour remains uh, a difficulty, particularly uh, within the horticultural sector, uh, where tons of produce have been left unpicked in recent years. Um, this has resulted from a multitude of factors, sort of including a reliance on migrant labour and a lack of domestic workers wanting to fill these roles um, that are often in rural areas, well away from the majority of the population and where unemployment uh, is at its highest. Um, energy and fertiliser prices um, have hit UK farmers hard. Um, part of the reason for recent vegetable shortages uh, that we saw sort of back in March uh, have been because of uncertainty for return on investment um, from many producers that has led to many crops like cucumbers, tomatoes, um, not being grown in uh, sort of heat hungry greenhouses. Um, forming a further dependence on foreign imports. Uh, the government as well is currently introducing its new environmental land management scheme uh, that serves to provide public money for public goods, 
uh, and is seen as a step in the right direction uh, by many uh, with the sustainable farming initiative uh, within that, um, rewarding farmers and landowners for managing their land in ways that uh, helped soil quality and reduce impact on biodiversity through a multitude of different standards. Um, Others say that these standards don't provide provide adequately uh, or provide adequate compensation for the work that farmers are required to put in to meet them, um, as well as the potential losses that could be incurred from changes to their management practices. And these debates sort of around these new incentives have meant that many farmers don't know what to make of the situation and uh, what their best next move is um, and in such an uncertain economic climate. Uh, these and many other factors leave UK food production in a fairly vulnerable position, um, but there are those out there uh, that are putting the work in to come up with solutions and alternatives um, to a great deal of these issues uh, to allow the UK and the world to grow more, using less, and hopefully with reduced environmental impacts. Our three speakers today uh, cover a large range uh, within UK agriculture from high-tech futuristic solutions uh, to the knowledge of, and traditions of old. We have experts in the field of regenerative agriculture, vertical farming and local peri-urban food growing. Is there space for all of them within the future ahead of us? And which are the most promising technologies that can lead us to a more sustainable food system? Our first speaker today is uh, Aaron Redman from Innovation for Agriculture. Uh, after undertaking uh, a master's in environmental soil science, uh, Aaron has taken on many roles, uh, including research into the regulating services of tropical soils, particularly interested in soils potential for carbon capture, leading him to start his own company, footprinting farms and their ability to sequester carbon. He's also spent time at Agricultural uh, Development Advisory Service or ADAS, um, within crop research, as well as the waste management company Veolia, uh, focusing on the contribution of organic manures in replacing conventional fertilizer and the policy that surrounds that transition. His current role um, sees him at Innovation for Agriculture, um, a UK nonprofit uh, in the UK um, that aims to connect farmers with farming research. Uh, the rapid changes that are happening to the planet and the industry make this translational work as important as ever, um, especially when we're talking about Aaron's speciality, uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, new government incentives uh, and building scientific literature over the last few years are advocating for a shift away from the conventional management of land uh, to help regenerate and maintain soil quality. So to delve into this uh, movement uh, that is bringing farming tradition into the modern era, um, I'd like to hand over to Aaron. Um, uh, yeah, so over to you. Brilliant, cheers, baby. That's absolutely fantastic introduction. And thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm just sharing my screen. So just let me know if it's um, when it's ready. Are you good? Can you see my screen, Toby? Yeah, yeah, that's all good. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Aaron and I'm basically, my role here today is just to discuss a little bit about um, regenerative agriculture and the background to that term. Um, and I'm gonna try and explain um how we kind of came about to where the kind of term came from and, and why we why we need it um in the industry so um conventional agriculture has existed for um in many forms over the last few thousand years and um, originating when nomadic humans began to settle and started cultivating land over a longer period of time since then significant shifts have occurred of how the average farmer manages their land. This has been impacted by factors such as technical, technological innovation, including the development of biochemicals and synthetic fertilizers, mechanization where we've brought larger machinery to help cultivate land and manage larger land areas in a single day, as well as the demand for food, especially in the post-war era. 
Today, conventional agriculture is designed to produce high yields at, at large scale, using all methods possible to increase productivity. However, it's increasingly accepted that this is no longer sustainable and we need a new solution. So regenerative agriculture is an umbrella term for agricultural land management, which leaves the soil, the land, the landscape, the environment, including climate, in a better condition than when we started. But when, <clears throat> but what does it take to shift the conventional mindset? All of these factors impact the mindset of how we manage our land. They dictate government policy, public perspective, and shift the responsibility and role of farmers, not only to produce food. So for me, regenerative agriculture is a way to absorb carbon and mitigate climate change. That's something that lies quite closely to my heart. Enhancing soil health is another essential uh, output of regenerative agriculture and is intrinsic to management practice. And then also the food that is produced by regenerative agriculture should be higher in nutrition and nutrient density. So health is another important fa uh, factor. To others, especially farmers, it's a way of increasing profitability by reducing the cost of inputs and increasing the margins of their farming business. It may also be a way of generating resilience against um, uncertain climates, especially in the future. Uh, last year, we saw a huge drought in the UK. Regenerative agriculture should be a way of mitigating those uncertainties. And then, especially culturally and to people who own their own land, it's a way of providing a better start for the next generation. So to the industry, it's a way of meeting targets, both national and global. It's a way of accessing grants, such as the Environmental Land Management Scheme. And it's a way of providing public goods, such as flood mitigation. So there are basically five key principles to regenerative agriculture, which act, of, act as guidelines to your farming management plan. The first is minimal soil disturbance, which is to avoid ploughing, especially deep cultivations when you're creating a seed bed. The second is diversity, so to promote diversity within your crop rotation and within your um, livestock or uh, stocking regime. Uh, and this is to increase the biological and structural capabilities of soil and also to increase resilience to disease and pathogens. The third is to keep soil cover, covered, whether that's with, with a living or organic mulch. So that could be your um, straw or your, the crop residue from the last crop that you uh, harvested. And then the fourth is maintaining a living root which is to help uh, maintain soil structure and reduce the uh, risk of runoff. And the fifth is more of an optional arable um, principle, which is to integrate livestock within your rotation. And basically that comes from uh, livestock have been proven to promote the biological and microbiological activity of the soil. So it's a, it's a soil enhancement to have that um, that grazing rotation, and then the beginning at the beginning of it all, you you have to understand the the contents of your farming operation before you make that transitional shift, and that is to understand the numbers, understand the amount of fuel you use, the amount of inputs you use, and this is to reduce the risks of that transition. But basically the best and the only real way to explain regenerative agriculture as it's uh, quite a broad spectrum umbrella term is to show it in action and this is uh, one example this is Boycefield farm in Herefordshire about 350 acres and it's managed by Billy Lewis who is our mixed farmer of the year they have an all-round regenerative system where they manage their livestock regeneratively and they manage their arable crops regeneratively in a circular system. So they're 
livestock and arable will share the same land. So on the left here, you can see a herbal lay, a mixture of annual and perennial herbs and grasses, which is then grazed by the Herefordshire livestock. Um, they use mob grazing practices where the fields are separated into smaller paddocks via electric fence. And so about 0.1 hectares is grazed with high density of cattle for a very short period of time. Once this land has been grazed, it will be direct drill, so uh, without the use of a plow, a, a plow, with a cereal crop. And that cereal crop will have an understory of clover. So on the right hand side, you can see that the cereals are being harvested and then underneath the, the ripened um, cereals, you have a living mulch of clover, which is a legume. And so therefore it sequesters, um, oh, sorry, it, it, it fixes nitrogen, uh, therefore reducing the nitrogen requirements for the next crop. And yeah, I advise everyone to kind of, if you're interested in regenerative agriculture, get online and have a look at some farm walks are going on and really you have to be on farm to really see it in action and see the benefits that, um, you know, are, are about that. All right. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks for that, Aaron. Uh, right. We'll move on to our second speaker today um, and introduce Tanvir Khan, um, who's Head of Science uh, at Innovation for Agriculture. Um, Tanvir has her background uh, in plant physiology, uh, gaining her PhD from GB Pants University of Agriculture and Technology in India uh, before moving into research and strategic roles uh, at companies such as DuPont Pioneer and CC Brazil, establishing research and business strategy uh, and integrating new technology development platforms. Uh, she, more recently, uh, she was Norwich based um, at Tropic Biosciences, uh, where she worked with gene editing uh, to de develop no novel traits in crops such as rice. Uh, with 2022 ushering in her most recent move to intelligent growth solutions. Um, who use new vertical farming technologies uh, to address some of the mountain challenges uh, that horticultural industry faces today. Uh, Tanvi's role here focuses on applying her expertise to develop crop recipes uh, for customers uh, and um, productization trials um, and uh, more specialized recipes designed to develop critical components for certain crops um, such as nutritional value. Um, she's also closely involved in the establishment of IGS's uh, research network, uh, supporting run, uh, write and executing projects in partnership with academic institutions across the globe. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Tambe, um, to let us know more about the roles of these new technologies uh, in the future of agriculture. Thank you, Toby, for the nice introduction. Um, I will just move for the presentation so okay so it's taking a bit of time oh okay oh god i think i need to go and share a window or a tab my goodness okay Bear with me, please. It's just taking a bit no of problem. time here. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. And is that the right presentation? Because somehow I'm not very, uh, you know, used to Google Meet, but if that's the introduction slide to uh, IGS and my name on it, that's fine. That's correct. All right, great. OK, lovely to meet you all here. I will give an overview of IGS, which is uh, Intelligent Growth Solution. It's a vertical farming infrastructure providing company uh, based out of Scotland. We have our head office in Edinburgh and we have two additional centers. One is at Inverkeething, which is Engineering Innovation Center. Uh, the other one is Crop Research Center, where I'm based. It's in Dundee, uh, next to James Hutton Institute. 
So for those who want to know. So, okay. Okay, so, um, an overview of IGS. So uh, this company was started by a real farmer in 2013, uh, Sir Henry Aykroyd, because he was selling his produce to Michelin star restaurants. Uh, but due to the climatic changes or um, all the other influences of weather and so, the produce wasn't of great quality. So he thought of, uh, you know, looking deep into it, like what are the stimulus that can give you better quality produce and one of the solutions was looking into the controlled environment agriculture then he got into touch with an engineer um, dave scott who is the chief technology officer in the company and together they built they founded this company igs and they built the towers and everything associated with that so this is just an overview we have um, Significant investment we got 48 million in Series B recently, and uh, out of which 12 is in, invested in R&D. We have 23 patents in the four families, mostly related to the LED lightings that we have, uh, the HVAC system, and few uh, fertigation system, and so on. Uh, our towers are fully productized. I will uh, explain a bit more how they are and what we actually do here. And uh, what we call is we have added a T to the CEA, which most of you uh, would be used to. So T stands for total, total controlled environment agriculture. OK, so we control everything right from temperature, humidity, lighting and all the stimulus that we give to the plants in our towers. And some of the people from Sheffield, they actually visited us here in Dundee a couple of months ago. That was a fantastic visit. So, yeah. and anyone is welcome uh, here so you can visit us we are more than happy to uh, show people around engage with them and so on on the right hand side we have just a list of our investors who uh, who feel that we are on the right track and we are doing the right thing uh, igs is already selling towers to the customers and we already have got the customers across four continents so this is significant achievement um, based on the technology um, igs got um, some of the awards so this is screen i'm not going to talk you through all that this is uh, more from our sales deck uh, what's important to us the scientific community here is uh, this big question that we are often asked like why grow vertically so we have the open field uh, you know agriculture and we have the greenhouses and then recently we have a, a, a boom in the vertical farming industry now what first of all the need so we know that agriculture is the world's largest water consumer there are climate changes associated with that and slowly we have seen that even the soil is degrading and unfortunately it's happening at a faster pace much faster pace than we the scientific community are able to find solutions Okay, no matter how fast we run, but we are unable to catch up to that. So uh, other factors also include the world's population and everything. So I don't have to explain this to all you brilliant people over here. But where we position ourselves from IGS is that we are one of the multiple solution providers or multiple, um, you know, we are one small bit to tackle this big, uh, big uh, thing called climate change. And IGS's business proposition is very interesting. So we don't compete with open field agriculture, neither with the greenhouse agriculture. And what we say here at IGS is that vertical farming, it should be a tool uh, in the big toolbox that a farmer should have to get high quality produce and to get a significant return on investment to carry on with the livelihood. And this is the same thing, that there is no golden bullet for climate change. We all have to come together and fight this. So this is where we stand out, um, you know, compared to most of the other vertical farming companies who, who tend to do everything, R&D and, uh, you know, for the production and some claims around even uh, vertical farming being better than open field or so. We don't make such claims. We are just, whatever can be grown inside, let's just try to do that. So this is where we have, I mean, uh, trying to reduce the impact of the environmental uh, changes that are happening on, on a significant uh, scale at the moment. We 
we have the vertical towers. And just for people to explain, if you think we have a field and then we cut them up into smaller, like six uh, square meter trays, which is equivalent to like a snooker table. And then we stack, uh, stack them up, okay? And we have these six, nine, or even 12 meter high towers, what we call as IGS, uh, you know, our own IGS towers. So you'll see multiple layers of these slots whereby we can actually grow the plants. And then, we create the proper growing, condi uh, growing conditions over there by regulating the temperature, humidity, and the lighting conditions. Uh, besides that, we do have our software and the data science team uh, who have made it possible that we can just run it using um, a tablet. Okay. Another interesting thing for us is um, you can regulate the growing condition of your uh, GTL from anywhere in the world because it's all uh, you know, cloud-based. And this is how these towers look like. So you have these different uh, slots, or when we say GTL, this is basically growth tray with the lights, okay? So growing tray will have a liner whereby you can grow your plants. And then on the top, you have these bars of LEDs. We use different spectrums. We have blue, green, red, and far red. Uh, and then each of these uh, panels of the light, they can be run at a different lighting recipe. Um, the fertigation is provided uh, through one uh, central fertigation tank for each GTL and also the heating, uh, ventilation and the air conditioning is there. So the heat produced due to these LEDs is actually cooled by uh, this air conditioning. So you have a continuous flow and that makes our um, towers 30% more cost effective in terms of energy compared to another one. The other thing is that these LEDs, they also run on DC instead of AC power. So it's significant, um, you know, uh, technological advancements have been made in our growth towers to save on the energy cost. Okay. Um, besides this, we do um, have a IGS research network. So the reason I brought up this slide, because we, we have several um, university um, professors, students, and everyone. And at IGS, we, we believe that uh, we, if, we want to, if we want to advance our discovery or research pipeline, the best way to do it is together with the academicians. So this is the concept. My colleague, Chris Horn, he is the head of IGS Research Network Partnership. Um, our aim is to identify world-class partners in different areas. So if you look at science, and engineering, there are so many disciplines, okay? And even if we focus on the plant sciences, there are so many species that we work on. There are so many areas of so photobiology or nutrition or lighting or everything. So we can't do all that alone. So we have uh, these projects that we run through our global network, okay? And uh, this is uh, how our network looks like. Um, this research network, it started around uh, two and a half to three years ago. We have already identified uh, partners in North America, Western Europe, Southeast Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and we are expanding more into other areas as well, depending on the need and uh, uh, you know, depending on the area where the need is. So for example, if a university wants us to set some towers there, conduct their research, they are allowed to do that research. IGS will own part of that tower to do their directed research. So it benefits the university, it benefits the students because they can actually do their research in these kind of advanced tower facilities and it benefits us because uh, you know we don't do it completely on our own and then there is an uh, IP element associated with that for the university as well as for us and we run at a faster pace. If we try doing everything on our own, it will uh, it will take years for us. Um, just to give an overview what we um, actually have in our crop portfolio. So we grow almost everything. So you might have seen that in vertical farms, people grow herbs and leafy greens. Of course, that's one of our prime priority because our customers who buy the towers from us, their main focus is herbs and leafy greens, but then there are customers 
um, now when they have seen that we are able to grow anything like trees or flowers, tomatoes, seed potatoes, radish, chilies, and strawberries, uh, we have a big demand coming from those customers. So th the demand is driven by the customers, and then the R&D is driven by this demand, if you can see. So we have different areas uh, you know, where we would uh, like to engage with universities and academicians to drive our R&D partnership. Um, and yeah, that's it. We are based right next to James Hutton Institute. That's the picture of our CEO, David Farquhar. You can follow him on LinkedIn. And there is a webinar about vertical farming and energy usage and everything. And that's really um, you know, interesting, especially for young students and uh, you know, academicians as such to have the conversation. And then we have some pictures of my team members over here. So that's who we are. And uh, yep, that's it all about IGS. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that, Tamba. Yeah, nice sort of contrast between the sort of different approaches there. Uh, hopefully, we'll get that back again. Uh, sort of into the, our final speaker today, um, which is uh, Doug Kemp, uh, who is the head grower at uh, the Sheffield-based uh, food cooperative Regather. Um, so I say D Doug works for the Regather co co uh, cooperative in Sheffield uh, as their full-time grower uh, on their farm in the Moss Valley. Um, Doug grew up in London before moving north to study geography at the University of Sheffield moved back to London, saw him get back involved in various local projects, uh, specifically a community garden um, in Hackney. Uh, leaving paid work in London in 2014, he travelled the UK and Europe uh, whilst volunteering on several organic farms and small holdings, uh, which sparked interest in organic horticulture and a life lived on the land. Uh, Travels now over. Uh, London didn't seem to have the right opportunities uh, for this new life, um, uh, but a second move back to Sheffield in 2016 did, uh, enabling uh, this to become a reality uh, with an opportunity to join Regather uh, and work on their veg box uh, business uh, before committing to help uh, develop uh, Regather's new farm in 2018. Um, so it's my pleasure to pass over to our final speaker, um, highlighting the importance of local food production and also how appropriate technologies need to match need to be matched their circumstances if we are uh, to build resilient food systems at a range of different scales uh, so doug over to you thanks very much toby uh, good afternoon everyone i'm just gonna share my screen um i've got some slides um they're just photographs of um some of the things we get up to on our farm and i'll just sort of scroll through them a bit as i give you my intro uh some of these some of these slides um might be uh, appropriate to think about as we go through some q a later okay so um yeah regather we're a, we're a cooperative based in sheffield um we've got our sort of head office quite near the city center in sharrow and um, our current main business uh, is a veg box delivery service to about 500, just over 500 homes in Sheffield. Um, so typically we've bought produce from local farms and a sort of more regional wholesaler. Um, the, all the food is uh, certified organic. We sell some dry goods as well as bread and eggs and stuff like that. So you can get, you know, a fair bit of your weekly shopping in our, in our box, but the, the, the majority of it's veg and then fruit. Um, and yeah, we, 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 we deliver those weekly. Um, uh, yeah, like Toby said, in 2018, we started talking to some uh, landlords about uh, taking on a lease of a field in the Moss Valley. That's about um, a 15 minute drive from our head office premises on just on the south of Sheffield. Um, the field was previously farmed by an arable farmer who's growing, I think, wheat and barley on it. And he didn't want to do farm that much land anymore. So the field was the field was sold. Um, and yeah that that's a photograph of the field in the first year um and we've set about trying to transform this field which was which is a small part of, of one or two farmers one farmer and his brother is a small part of their operation into a sort of thriving busy you know fairly uh, compact uh, small small farm um which is hopefully going to be able to employ more than just a couple of people a couple of people's time a few days a week um 
so there's a there, so there's a there's an employment sort of question to what we're doing as well you know trying to trying to put people back on the land in greater numbers than maybe has been the the the, the, the general move um through sort of mechanization um after the war uh, particularly so yeah there, there's there's an early picture of the field and then there's some of our other busier areas where we're growing things in polytunnels um what's important for us is that like we we, we sell direct um and it's and it's all super local so all the people who buy from us live in sheffield and we sell direct to them we don't go through any other any other retail outlet etc um so hopefully maximizing the price we can get for our produce um it's all organic certified um and there's a lot of important sort of uh a lot of important background to to what to that why it's important to us you know and build, building soil being the the most fundamental thing um and yeah it's all about for us it's all about choosing the right technology for our for our context um and for us really the technological question i kind of always think about it in two in two ways it's we're a small new entrant um small business really and we're new entrants and we don't have access to large amounts of startup capital um and funding and that kind of stuff um you know we do get some obviously but 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 it's, it's relatively small really and um so the technology has to be affordable but it also has to be sort of appropriate for our scale and our context um you can see there's a fat photograph i'm currently showing shows how you know that's the that's the field and it's, it's penned in by lots of other fantastic habitat which i always think is worth um worth thinking about but there's a whole mosaic of other fields around us in in the moss valley um and some of our neighbors have got similar set up to us but mostly it's just arable um and we, we we grow vegetables um and top fruit so yeah lots of more intensive and uh, the, so the technology has got to be appropriate and and often for us that means um that means human powered and it means you know, things we can use with our hands uh, and it also means quite low tech it needs to be things that we can we can acquire and then uh, use ourselves without much complex training or integration into a wider system and um and it needs to be things that um yeah that are human powered i suppose the stuff we can fix and maintain ourselves over time um there's a there's my colleague dave with this side and we use that for some of our grassland management you know um and there's me on something called a broad fork which again is a is a is a very low tech um quite interesting quite interesting tool to help us on our smaller scale uh, like our intensive level um, one of the other key things for me is I always like to think about what we're doing in terms of technology, not just being about tools or like, you know, um, sort of, should we say man-made stuff, um, but um, we use a lot of sort of, I guess, nature-based solutions to some of the challenges we're facing. Uh, and what you can see there is a, is a, is a green manure crop, um, and we're using that to look after the soil, and we're trying to practice uh, new ways of using them or well we're really looking to the peers in the sector who are, who are, who are, who are sort of pioneering new stuff and we're, we're, as new entrants we sort of copy them um and um and, you know, we, we, so we're using things like green manures to try and help us manage the soil better which is actually going to reduce our reliance on technology specifically our diesel hungry noisy you know quite nature destructive tractor actually that's something we're trying to you know, we we we're trying to move away from being so reliant on on, on those kind of tools, and and I can talk more more about it later, maybe if there's a question. But it's, it's things to do with green manures, and actually on the on the right hand side of that slide is a is a black tarpaulin as well, which we use in use in conjunction with the green manures. Um, that's a crop of um, some brassicas, and underneath that there is some there's a green manure crop just germinating. Um, which um, I didn't have a more recent photograph of it, unfortunately, because it looked quite spectacular. But that's that's another interesting thing we're trying, and it's like this nature-based solution to to some of the challenges that, again, is, a, is appropriate on our on our scale. And I don't know. I wonder if Aaron has some thoughts on on the similar kind of stuff with the regenerative agriculture topic as well. Um, this is one of our polytunnels. So again, this is some this is some other technology we're using to extend our growing season, and. Um, with the changing climate we're finding that these you know really useful growing spaces are, are, are getting very hot in some of the summers and we're trying to find ways to mitigate that and what we do here is we plant lots of other beneficial plants under the tomatoes and that has a, that has a cooling effect on the soil and lots of, other, lots of other benefits for the for the soil life and hopefully brings healthy plants without the need to like install complex high-tech solutions into the tunnel um 
That's um, some flowering brassica plants inside the tunnel, which is something to do with integrated pest management, you know, bringing pest control into the tunnel uh, by leaving things to flower, another, another nature-based solution. That's a not very good photograph, but some of those, those are some of the eggs of the ca cabbage white, uh, the wasp that eats cabbage white caterpillars. So that is evidence of us, you know, having a nature-based solution to the to example of pest control. Uh, that's me and some volunteers planting some trees as part of our agroforestry system. I can talk about that later. That's another, that's another sort of nature-based change to the farm that's helping us um, adapt to changing climate. Um, wood chip, we use a lot of that. That's, uh, that's another, another thing we can we can talk more about if you want about how, how we're using how we're using a resource to like build fertility on the land. Again, yeah, low low tech and it's got quite low input, but there's lots of benefits, including building things like a wood a wood chip hotbed for raising plants um uh, that's just me me and the team and some volunteers having silly photo at the end of a hard work day okay that's it for me um a bit of an overview and yeah hopefully some more questions i can answer later on sweet great thanks for that doug um great so now we've sort of got to meet our our speakers a bit um like to sort of throw this open to a bit of a of a discussion uh sort of around some of these these topics um so we've got sort of a few, few sort of uh questions sort of to, to link some of these aspects together um the, the main one for for, for for me and my interest is how do these approaches trickle down to to sort of the, the consumer and, and the farmer and how and how they're sort of applied and so how affordable are, are these different technologies sort of to implementation at the farmer level, but then also as it comes down to the consumer, um, are they just for the privileged few that can afford to pay a premium um, for either best farming practices or for some higher inputs that are required? Um, or can they actually be rolled out to feed the masses um, and have potential to form a sort of a big substantial part of our food system? Um, Aaron, I don't know if you'd like to kick off with some of the trade-offs potentially that uh, uh, come with, with regenerative agriculture. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think one of the most common questions that gets asked towards regenerative farmers and regenerative advisors is, is can we feed the planet whilst using regenerative techniques? And, um, and, and quite frankly, my answer is yes. Um, I think you can quite easily beat around the bush and and say there are yield reductions yeah there are yield reductions for sure um it kind of depends where you are what like in for any agricultural industry it always comes down to where you are um what you're farming and and the kind of more specific uh, things of your business operation um so you know, I, I work with some farmers who, like Billy Lewis, for example, who are, who was in my presentation. Um, his cereal production, I think, on his winter wheat, he he gets about um, between nine and ten tons per hectare, and the UK average is about eight, according to RB two hundred nine. So, um, yeah, I, my answer is yes. Uh, the general um, the general timeline of of productivity on regenerative farms is is that in the first few years you get a reduction for sure because you're you're working on a canvas of conventional agriculture that may be um as little as as one to three percent organic matter within that within that field and also i wonder, I, I wonder how how doug deals with this because if if you're if you're turning old arable land or old conventional arable land into high productive vegetable schemes um you know what are your what are your methods of uh, of maintaining productivity in those first years uh, years before um before the soil biology kind of has time to to react that's a question All right. Was that a direct question? Shall I jump in on that? Is that good? If you want, I mean, yeah. it's probably best to, to have it as a discussion. Y yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Really interesting point, Aaron. Thanks for that. Yeah, you're quite right, and I really like that term, the um, the canvas of conventional agriculture. Like, um, yeah, it's been really difficult in the first few years, and and sort of as a business, we've had to really kind of just accept and absorb the hit, you know, on the fact that like yields are going to be down. 
um, and, um, and and that's certainly the case. Is it because it, it, you can't instantly bring the soil back to, to good health after you know, and and it certainly wasn't within. I mean, Toby's been to the site with colleagues, and I guess you guys sort of confirmed that it, it wasn't in a good good state when we took it over. Um, so we've got our various soil management practices, which are you know wide ranging and and sort of well tested by other organic growers, I suppose. Um, and um so, but what yeah so one of the things that that, we, that we've done is is is, is it sort of accept that we're going to have the reduction of yield, yield as a business um which we could do because we already had a, a, a we already had a, a business of the veg box that was that was running so we could kind of cross cross support ourselves and we're also like gradually working our way through the field we haven't developed the whole farm at once we've taken it in stage by stage which has allowed us to sort of you know bring the soil management practices on board gr gradually um but it's just it's been a steep learning curve actually and um and yeah there wasn't there wasn't really an easy fix it's a big part of the challenge uh just to say our, our landlords did um, did do some they did they did put down a, a special crop to try and help bring the fertility up and and they and they held the field in that state for a couple of years before even you know letting yeah. it be up for rent but it, you know it, there was a lot more to do than that and so we're still within the process but a big challenge actually yeah I mean, I've got a, uh, I've got one of uh, a farmer in Herefordshire who's um, decided to sign on to Countryside Stewardship for the next two years for exactly that reason, so he can put his fields to herbal lay for two years, get that um, kind of canvas back um, into a good shape, and get his fertility rates up, and then and then he'll start farming again. But it it really is like you know if if you're used to working with you know a high input system of which um as from the war in ukraine the price has suddenly gone through the roof um you know i i do not um i'm not surprised that there are farmers who are deciding to just put a hold on it go into countryside stewardship for a few years and then come back in come back to being major food producers later down the line yeah, and of course that affects yields, doesn't it? Because whilst people are taking a portion of their land out, then that isn't producing food. So yeah, that's that's a yeah, tricky exactly. thing to <clears throat> Kind of li link linking that back, Doug, uh, to sort of the affordability question. You, you, you guys on on your sort of smaller scale and using mm -hmm. organic, how how do you find that that that, that links into potentially scaling this to to to, to feed uh, to feed them the masses? Mm -hmm. Can can you see this? What what, what where do you f feel that it sits within within the system? Yeah, so it's a good, good question, actually. Um, yeah, we're, we're, I mean, we're on 15 acres, so it's really, really, it is very small. But, you know, because we're doing it quite intensively, we're focused on veg, you can produce quite a lot of food. Um, obviously, in proportion of the people that live in Sheffield, it's minuscule, but we would suggest that, like, you just need to replicate our field to lots of the other ones. And, <laughs> excuse me, I think there's a there's an argument for, like, the... Um, Yes, like the geography of it all. So may, maybe maybe the operations like ours are best closest to the to the market. So like ringing ringing a city on the appropriate land, whereas some of the larger scale stuff that's going to go through different supply chains and maybe feed into supermarkets or more interesting food hub. <laughs> you know, I'm not, the, the other, other other ways than, than supermarkets perhaps. You know, um, and whole, wholesalers like some of the people we work with. Um, you know, maybe maybe that kind of stuff is further out from the big population centres. The stuff with a less direct sales model, um, because there are other efficiencies that you could gain from scaling up that, that things that aren't applicable to our context. But those efficiencies and the scaling up would involve bigger investments. You know, um, what, you know, there's all sorts of, of things you need to invest in, I suppose. And again, ours is ours is low tech and and small scale. Like whether that's the tractor, the fleet of vehicles we use, the storage, the packing, all that kind of stuff. You know, we're on the smaller end of things. But we can do it because it's small scale, and the food basically gets to the customer 24 hours after we after we pick it. But as soon as you scale up, I think you have to add in more of that infrastructure, which costs more, but it might be it might still remain efficient because you've changed the scale. I guess. Um, Tambu, I didn't on, on the flip side of this, sort of on the potential of uh, sort of limitations that that from 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 these uh, approaches, from having more high, high inputs on the other end with vertical farming, how how does that play into the affordability of, of produce that comes out of um, out of these vertical farms? So um, we are not the direct sellers of the produce. Okay, we are enablers. So 
we have uh, for example one of the customers this is one of the largest customers based in suffolk okay so we enable them by setting up the towers growth recipes and everything and they are providing their uh, food uh, sorry produce for tesco there are few others in different continents who are interested in providing this kind of uh, you know quality nutritive and fresh uh, food to supermarkets okay we do have some level of community initiative as well with igs because one of the goals when we develop our recipes okay growth recipes for any crop be it herbs or leafy green or uh, fruit crop is to focus on two things one is the yield nutritional quality and the energy efficiency so we fine tune those recipes so it is cost effective for our customer so you know they break even they get good return on investment and then the overall downstream they can sell almost at a competitive price to the um, you know supermarket so that's the aim yes yeah, so it's passing on those those findings that you have to to be able to facilitate it further down the line um, ch chatting to you guys, sort of building up to, to this discussion, uh, it was it was very interesting that a lot of you had had a lot of interest in uh, in talking about some 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 synergies and ways that these different technologies how how can they work together in the future that we're that we're looking forward to, um, and and where where are the trade offs here? Um, so is it possible for them to work side by side, sort of potentially part of diversification strategies for farmers? Um, and what, what barriers are there um, that we find sort of at, at the grower level um, for, for maybe adopting some of these technologies? I don't know if Doug, you maybe want to, to kick us off uh, sort of speaking about that. If, if you were thinking about uh, getting a vertical farm on, on the regather site, what, what, what is it that, uh, that's really, um, that would stop you the most and uh, what barriers are kind of in, in place there? Mm, yeah, that's interesting, Toby. Um, I, th I think um, I think my feeling is that like all these different, um, they're all different tools, aren't they? In this big challenge we face about like you know changing the changing the land use of the planet whilst producing enough food for us. And I sort of alluded to it a, a, bit, a bit ago, but there's there's like there's like yeah, different geographies are, are where things are different, more appropriate or not. Uh, I, regather are quite interesting because. I mean, I don't know, not everyone's going to know Sheffield, but where our building is, is it's sort of like the top point of a triangle in the centre of Sheffield. And then we've got this sort of sphere of influence that we work in, which is a, which is a triangle like heading south. And the farm is on the bottom sort of flat wedge of the triangle, should we say, um, in the Moss Valley. And I, and I don't, I think my, my, my gut feeling is that the vertical farms don't really sit there in that, in that farm belt at the bottom of the, or the bottom of the, of the triangle. However, between there and our, and our building, there's a lot of urban space and not necessarily dense urban space. And there are, there are, there's brownfield sites and there's, there's other, there's other sort of other different bits of land use in that, in that sort of geographical area, which might be more, and might, might be more appropriate to have like the these high intensity vertical farms, but, you know, this is something along those lines. I, 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 that's the way I sort of would see this stuff blending together. And then I guess maybe some of the larger farms Aaron works with, they could sit alongside a farm like ours, or or maybe even slightly further out. But it's, it's something along those lines feels feels appropriate, I suppose. I think Tambo raised a hand. Yeah, can I pitch in here because I um, one of the things that we. Um, we follow here at IGS is we believe in the hybrid model. So I said in the start of my uh, presentation that there is no one golden bullet for solving all the problems, okay? And uh, after listening to both you, Doug and Aaron, just a thought crossed my mind, <laughs> which is regenerative agriculture. It is as important as any other thing that I'm trying to do or you are trying to do. And if we see we are attacked by this uh, human activity and the climate change activity significantly in terms of food security, in terms of soil deterioration, in terms of deforestation. So again, not going too geographic, but uh, what I would propose is if there is a land that needs reclamation, okay, or we can make better use that is through regenerative agriculture. There is also a possibility to use that land to set up a vertical farm and grow whatever can be done. Our farms can run on solar, okay, our farms can run on wind. So the choice basically lies with the customer. And then the polytunnels, because we, we know that uh, we can produce strawberries in in the vertical farms, but that may not be very energy efficient towards the later stages of the fruit development. 
So polytunnels, you know, we can grow that. We we do a lot of uh, starter plant uh, growth in our vertical farms, and where these starter plants are gonna go, mainly tunnels or greenhouses or wherever. So for us, I think what we are trying to do here at IGS is develop this model whereby we make these hybrids and do a complete analysis on the produce. Like what is the best way for a particular type of grower in a particular region? Because the need for Middle East is going to be different from Scotland, from Australia and America. So our sales team, uh, you know, they try to work out these kind of models, but I think we, uh, as uh, you know, research people, we can give them a hand in doing the same. I'll just chip in quickly. Yeah, yeah that, that point about growing the right crop in the right place on the right farm is, is very applicable to us. There's lots of things we don't grow because it's we're not going to be good, as good at it. And strawberries is one of them, actually. So. Mm -hmm. Aaron, have you got uh, got some thoughts on how regenerative agriculture can on that thing of uh, uh, how that can integrate potentially with these sort of vertical vertical farming solutions? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I think part of regenerative agriculture is that diversification. There's a reason why conventional farmers make the transition in the first place, and usually it's it's due to some sort of business. Um, flagging like they may have it may be flagged that they they are their profits are, are declining and their inputs are increasing and and their yields are going down or you know there are many many reasons and and as a farm diversifies usually they look at it on a, a large scale so regenerative agriculture may be one thing that they are looking at but you know, holiday cottages are another thing that farms commonly do. Poultry units are another one. Um, and yeah, I, I think if the one thing that farmers would need to know, I think, is, is are the numbers. So if someone came up to a farmer and was like trying to sell them a, a vertical grow unit, then if they could provide the the cost the yearly costs the the capital investment that's needed in the first place and the yield that they'll get out of it i'm sure if there's a good business case there i'm sure it would be spread by wildfire um and i think on, on a previous discussion that we had uh, toby um i think this is a good point to to bring it up where you know agriculture has a huge amount of spare nutrition um it's one of the reasons why farmers are getting impaled in the media there's there's a huge amount of spare nutrition out there and especially from um farms that have already diversified into pig and poultry and if we can somehow stabilize the nutrients that come out of our farming systems and reuse them in a circular economy back into a vertical grow system that would be absolutely fantastic and um and you know if anyone does have any ideas along those lines please please contact me because um that's you know things that we we really want to work on Sambu, have, uh, have you guys had any research sort of along those lines of circular system we, we are mm -hmm. planning yeah we are planning something so uh, maybe it would be good to chat uh, with you Aaron, because uh, there are some people who are coming to us we have both types of customers one who rely on the conventional fertilizers the other one which want to be organic or you know uh, provide other kinds of nutrients so we do we are considering something as a research trial for us you know and i think that would be ideal because uh, we here we try to run everything in a circular manner so recycle everything but at the same time this is the newer aspect that we will take up sometime last quarter of this year okay fantastic so we can catch up on that yeah please do please do yeah great i think um that, that kind of leads us to touch on uh an aspect uh, that's come from one of our pre-asked questions from um, Colin McCulloch. Um, he says that uh, the EU uh, sort of ca uh, cap common agricultural policy uh, led to all sorts of uh, distortions of agricultural markets and production, um, sort of gaming the system, and uh, sort of like butter mountains, wine lakes, um, and a free market seems to produce sort of volatility and sort of uncertainty for producers, uh, sort of glut and price slumps. Um, 
with sort of supply chain failures and shortages on the shelves um but we've come to expect cheap food um so we sort of established that everyone's sort of in in agreement that these are all part of of, of the future that we're looking forward to but uh but how can the state and, and policy uh help to effectively sort of intervene uh to ensure sort of proper nutrition and what's affordable for all so how, how can policy help to encourage uh, these these different avenues and how they can integrate together don't know who would like to jump in on that at first I can. Uh, we have had some discussions um, with some of the policymakers for UK and Scotland on these avenues. Um, I think they listen. They have a vision that yes, we would like to do uh, something what we we are already trying to do. But I think in the wider group, there has to be this mental block that needs to be removed that I want to stay only as greenhouse grower or I am 100% vertical farming or I am 100% open field grower. So we have to break these walls. We have to put the relevant people from these uh, you know, different uh, disciplines together on a table and say, let's work on it together. But policies, certainly we have raised several times um, Maybe some kind of joint grants, uh, you know, from UKRI or Innovate UK would be useful. We have had some discussions even in the House of Commons, um, you know, from IGS uh, representing there. So the, the drive has to come from different uh, avenues. Um, and then the decision maker, it has to be people who are part of this, uh, you know, uh, group discussion that we are having here. So. This is just my view on that. Just before we go on, do, do you feel like there's there's enough um, sort of policy and sort of a scope within the government um, for encouraging controlled environment agriculture um, uh, and uh, fostering? Uh, there, there is there is a there is a positive uh, you know outlook at the moment. I would say so. If you look at the um, discussions that happened in UKRI and also in the House of Lords and so on. Over last one year, I think they have uh, they are trying to put some policies in place and also trying to promote. So if you look at some of the grant applications around sustainability or controlled environment agriculture, these are just one way for uh, you know to allow people to think. Um, I think a bit more could be added to it by like having hybrid technologies coming together or multiple technologies coming together. So I haven't come across that kind of a uh, you know proposal or a policy yet. But it might come, you know, I'm quite positive of that. Well, hopefully out back of this we can encourage it. Uh, Aaron, would you like yeah. to jump in? Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with what uh, Tanva said that I think mindset is is absolutely key here. Um and it presents such a ma major boundary um to so many people and, and uh, it's you know it's not just the mindset of farmers it's it's the mindset of the consumer and it's definitely the mindset of the policy maker and you know the the development of environmental land management schemes elms is you know is a interesting and and i guess you could call it exciting step towards providing you know taxpayers with public goods um but there's it's also massively underselling um a policy to to farmers because you know on average i think there's about uh, a 60 to 70 reduction in in overall payment scheme so the amount that farmers get paid compared to the current policy is about 60 to 70 percent less um oh no sorry 60 to 70 percent of the total so so yeah basically farmers will get less for for making bigger changes and um and what the what policymakers could do here is is talk to the retailers and supermarkets and and basically um change the way that food is sold in this country and and basically get get people to pay more for for better food and i think consumers mindset needs to change towards the, the people need to consume less but better food and and this is where nutrient density comes into it if you can eat uh, food with higher nutrient density you don't need to eat as much and you get much better nutrition you know much better um bang for your buck 
better energy levels, you know, the list goes on. So, so yeah, I think that's where policymakers really, because I, you know, you can have an argument about who's who's uh, responsible to make these mindset decisions, but um, at the end of the day, I think the government holds a lot of responsibility. Yep, I think it's a closed loop system. We have to create awareness to drive the policies and that policies to drive the awareness. And uh, I mean, I couldn't agree more with you when you said about the overall value of the producer, how much the grower gets, and then that cost has to be compensated by the final cost that um, a consumer has to pay. Um, um, yeah, not sure if that uh, being that direct is going to work, but somehow we have to compensate with like you mentioned about the nutritive value enhancement or getting fresh produce from sustainable sources. I think that would promote more people to buy and maybe pay a few pence extra for that. I think we're, we're going to draw this element, just small discussion to a bit of a close as we're going to throw open as I want to give uh, the, the audience opportunities to, to be asking some questions, uh, get some direct answers. Um, to start off with from John Maiden, a short one, hopefully for uh, to Aaron, uh, just asking what the name of the case study was uh, that you mentioned in your um, presentation. Uh, case study, uh, the farm, the farm's Boycefield farm. Um, so if you look up uh, Billy Lewis, um, soil farmer of the year, there are uh, various articles on, on him as a farmer and um, yeah, he's absolutely fantastic. I think he actually does um, farm walks open to the public on his website. Um, so anyone can actually visit his farm on, on specified days. And yeah, he, he provides education on his farming regime, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, this one's uh, uh, to Tanvir um, from Colin Osborne. Um, do you have any estimates uh, of the energy or carbon uh, that's embedded uh, in your plant products? And uh, how does that compare to um, products from like a regular regular heating glass house? Yeah, so energy, yes. Uh, carbon, we are doing this study. Um, comparison uh, with the greenhouses, we have a case study under development that we are going to do. Okay, so we haven't got any direct comparison yet because nobody discloses this kind of thing to others. Uh, but we have undertaken a study with one of the universities in the United States to do this kind of a, a you know, comparison with the greenhouse system, with the vertical farming system on the carbon and the energy usage as well. But we have our own estimates. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, Aaron, do you, do you have any ideas of comparisons in terms of uh, impacts from the regenerative uh, sort of um, uh, impact on how that impacts on the carbon sort of embedded carbon and impacts um, from that side embedded carbon as in the right. carbon within the materials what what can be the impact so so uh, um so, so i'm sure carbon sequestration can come into into the talk within regenerative yeah. agriculture yeah any idea or, or, or sort of gen general figures around around that on on produce yeah yeah I, before uh, before i came on this discussion i, I just looked up some figures and um so generally for every percentage of organic matter that is sequest uh, is generated um so through the crop residue that is left within the soil the the root content um the humus that is developed after the organic matter has been broken down um all of these things that contribute to organic matter and um, for every 1% that is increased that's 1.5 tons of co2 equivalent per hectare so um, on average in the UK, the soil organic matter levels for arable farms are about 3%. Um, in many cases, they're as low as 1%. Um, and when I was working for Veolia, we were working on recreation, uh, sorry, regeneration projects um, to inject organic manure onto farms that had as little as 0.1% organic matter, which is just, you know there, there isn't anything it is you're basically talking sand um and on a lot of the regenerative farms that i work on especially when they have livestock integrated the organic matter levels can be anywhere between 
um, five to eight, even twelve percent um, through through some of these uh, systems. So you know, you you can be talking about a, a plus five or six um, percentage, um, which you know you're talking you know about you know you could be up eight to ten tons per hectare. You, you're really talking. Um, so on a large scale, that that's massive. Um, the other thing I was looking at is, according to um, the FAO, the soil loss accounts from from farm, farm gate emissions, um, which are like you said, I think thirty, yeah, thirty one point six percent of the global uh, emissions. Um, of of that thirty one percent, nineteen percent is from in the UK is from um, soil loss so regenerative agriculture would reduce that significantly because soil loss is is one of the main uh, benefits um and then and then um just looking at synthetic nitrogen is 2.1 percent of global emissions and 58 percent of that is in field emissions um, that would also be massively reduced because obviously you would not be using as much synthetic nitrogen so yeah i think a lot of the the savings are from reductions because the inputs are reduced the inputs of uh, biochemicals and synthetic fertilizers are reduced your diesel use, usage goes down because you shouldn't be traveling so much um and then and then also from uh, massive savings through soil loss and uh evapotranspiration um so so yeah i think you got massive savings and then the sequestration is is the major benefit that throws you over the line and you know the thing that everyone's talking about in terms of climate change is is net zero um uk goal and net zero is 20 well nfu goal is is 2040 um you know when farms start reaching those net zero goals then you know everyone's going to be screaming about you know regenerative agriculture because it's pretty much the only way that you can you can reach that goal Excellent. Thanks for that. I'm um, going to throw, throw it over to Doug. Uh, so since uh, this is from Ollie Chesworth. Um, so since you began uh, working for Regather, um, what has been the greatest success um, that you have been a part of? Um, and what has been the greatest challenge uh, that you've been a part of overcoming? Mm, um, thanks for the question, Ollie. Um, the six i mean the, the our little our little journey um to sort of set the farm up um um ha, was just so interesting because our first spring so sort of sort of, sort of kicking off um to, to get everything up and running you know to sort of in, build infrastructure and you know just see how we got on as growers was, you know it's a quite daunting complex new enterprise to take on because we we're all we we're all sort of novice really those of us involved we, we gave it a go so that that all happened at the same time as the covid pandemic outbreak <laughs> so we had there was, there was there was a wild three months so we weren't sure about the viability of the business or even how to how to do things like you know acquire materials or work with contractors so, so that was um that was that was that was a big big challenge um f for us to to, to overcome um we we didn't get to just um sort of sit into uh i mean i know this i'm not saying this flippantly but like we didn't get to sort of just wait it out through furlough which obviously had its impact on people you know but we we were like we, I, we've never worked so hard and so and been so busy uh, in such challenging times so that that was that was a, that was a big challenge and, and and maybe the fact that we managed to pull through that um well, you know and and sort of and, and and keep going and actually grow our customer base because turns out that's what people wanted was food delivered um so we sort of we sort of rode that out and and, and kept going um um so, that, so that, that was that was a lot to do in our context and, and the timing really but that, that's probably the biggest challenge and the, the success um one other thing i just was thinking about this uh, as you asked the question there was the fact that we are i think we're building soil i think we're bringing the health back um because um, we haven't got the ability to do complex tests and come up with stats um, in the same way that Tambir and Aaron have got access to, I don't think, because, because we're a small farm. But um, we've got ways of sort of checking in on the soil health, and it does seem to be that our management practices are making the moves in the right direction. So that's really good as well, because it's the fundamental thing to, to, to the whole operation, really, is having the healthy soil, which 
just going back to the previous question that the other two were answering was is probably you know by um by association going to have like better better carbon sequestration in the soil body. all those kind of benefits are probably you can't measure it at the moment but they're probably going to be um be sort of implicit in because of what we're doing excellent thanks doug uh i'm gonna, gonna field on here from uh, from peter jackson uh getting the, the grant from center um crew um so for uh, it, it was based towards aaron but uh, i'm going to extend this out to sort of a wider sort of discussion um so the question originally was would certification scheme uh, for like organic help or hinder regen ag movement uh, but i'd also like to th think about that in terms of for um sort of more climate conscious uh, farming in terms of tanvir if, if, if there was some aspect of certification that might help with vertical farming and equally dug with local food production is there some some way of, of if, that, if that was on on sale and making sure that it's it's, it's local some kind of certification for that would that help or hinder these movements um what, what are your thoughts i think certainly it would um you know any kind of a certification we are aiming to get few on different uh, aspects of course you know based on our processes so low carbon or net zero and all those kind of stuff um, also in terms of the quality of the produce so we are working at uh, some of the angles here not just looking at um, the content uh, in a particular produce so for example erucic acid in rocket we can estimate that using hplc but at the same time if we can get a certification from the authority so we have uh, got a person on board from uh, who used to run the, uh, the quality certification um, uh, area in MNS. Uh, so they are going to drive. But at the same time, this thing around what you mentioned about local produce and healthy and fresh, I think, yes, certainly it's going to be a big driver on top of rest, what we are trying to do. So, right, Tambu, which uh, which certifications is it that um, you guys are aiming to to get on the project? Um, so, the the quality certification related to um, let's say no presence of any kind of harmful uh, microbe or so. So, basically, from a quality and health perspective, and uh, also there are a few others based on, um, I mean, uh, the other audits, etc., that we have to run on our site over here because this actually enables more of a customer to follow the same practices and when they uh, they pass on um, this thing to the consumers these labels or these kind of certificates that actually help so you broaden the customer portfolio over there excellent aaron uh, what do you think in terms of region ag does it need a label yeah i think it's it's a bit of a weird one because you so you get questions about uh, regen versus organic, but I would argue organic is a version of regenerative agriculture. I would say organic is is a type of regenerative agriculture because you know the you can farm regeneratively what in an organic system, um, and obviously organic agriculture has been struggling since two thousand and ten, I think, and and I, I think it will you know reboot maybe but i i do think there is a there is necessity for labeling um so for example regenerative agriculture gets a bit of stick for the use of glyphosate and glyphosate is um is a herbicide but through many different scientific studies it's been proved it, it could have some significant detrimental impacts on on human and animal um, um, health and welfare, um, and actually, especially for me, it's the the fungi in the soils, which is can greatly be affected. Um, so yeah, I think appropriate management of land should always be realised and certified. Um, how you do that is, is obviously quite difficult because the consumer wants something simple to read; it, they want something that that is easy to absorb and um, so you don't want a load of facts and figures and a paragraph of text so yeah i think it's a really difficult one i i 100 percent think it would regenerative agriculture would benefit from certification and um, i think the the choice of certification is the important thing 
Yeah, I think that's the, the difficulty with such a, a complex approach with many different ways of, of achieving re regenerative, uh, however we want to define it, how how would you then boil that down to a, a simple label and who, who is and who isn't regenerative? Um, yeah. uh, so it's, it's an interesting one uh, with that. So there's a lot, lot, of, lot of barriers, I think, to, to, to getting to that point with it. Um, uh, Doug, in terms of like more local sort of... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, sort of produce. What, what, do you think there's any 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 uh, any, any room for, for for labeling of that? Um, you know, it's interesting. So just 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 back a tiny step. Then um, we are organic certified. Like we 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 we're fully paid up. Um, um, fully paid up with the soil association. Um, I've got my, we've got our soil. So we've got our inspection on Thursday in two days' time. I've been prepping for it this morning. You know, so it's a really rigorous, and well, well trusted, and you know, um, long standing certification label um, that, that that we're proud to participate in. Um, and it's interesting because that means a lot to us as an organisation, and we. Um, and it's also stipulated in our lease that we the, the land has to be managed under organic an organic certified scheme that's a condition from our landlords um but when we um we've we've canvassed our customers and asked them what's most important for them about choosing the regather veg box as a product and actually organic wasn't the main thing um local was the main thing that people liked um and organic was just a little bit behind that it, you know it was still important but it wasn't the main thing i think at our scale we do, wouldn't wouldn't actually need certified i think people there's an implicit sort of trust and where well, there's, there's an there's enough sort of connection with our customer base and enough transparency of what we do you know we have open days and you know we're well connected in sheffield that a lot of people know us like uh, uh, you know and uh, so i think they implicitly trust that uh that, that, that we're meeting the um that we're meeting the sort of local standards and whatever that means to that person because what is local it can, it's not really defined um people put, hold us to account on that kind of stuff quite a lot actually we're, we're quite happy to engage with people on that sometimes people realize that they've got a bit of out of spanish produce in their veg boxes because of the seasonal nature of vegetable supply in the uk and our, you know we're sort of trapped and reliant on spanish imports and sometimes people don't realize that but because we're transparent with saying where things come from they do realize and then it prompts a discussion and we can alter their product or you know inform them as appropriate so, and I'm, so i'm not sure i'm not sure if a certification any sort of labeling is totally necessary because we've, we've got a different way of doing it uh, but the local is certainly important um i think we could maybe do more to push the importance of organic actually and and because it's it's not just yeah. about spraying with pesticides and herbicides there's way more to it fundamental being soil health um but i don't i think that's sometimes lost um probably through the media and to, to uh, over the years and, and and the way customers interpret it um i think a lot of what the organic certification actually stands for probably it slots in really well alongside what regen ag is to be honest it's not they're massively compatible already um there's obviously some different stuff going around but I, I do think just to chip in on sort of things Aaron said, I, th I think what actually regenerative could do with a label because at the moment when it's or, or the certification because at the moment it's it's on it's on you, you could say you're regenerative and there wouldn't really be any way to check you know I suppose so I'd be interested to see how that developed um but yeah that's that's, that's my take on certification and stuff Right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for those bits there. Uh, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our time. Uh, so um, I would like to thank all of our speakers uh, for what they've contributed today. Um, I think we've had a really, really great discussion, gone over some really great topics. And we've found some good common ground as well. Uh, some, uh, we didn't get into the heated debate that may... <laughs> everyone's in too much agreement uh, but yeah it looks like some promising some promising uh, uh, collaborations for the future um as well um i did just want to um to point to uh the some other events that we've got coming up through from the grantham center uh in the next couple of weeks as part of the festival debate um where we, there are some other talks on urban densification. Uh, so sort of, is this the future of our cities? Uh, looking at a green infrastructure and how we can build a sustainable future. Um, 
and our urban green space is worth it. So they're all coming up on the program. So everyone, please go and um, grab some tickets for those and head along to those talks. And um, they're going to be just as uh, enthralling as uh, as this one. Um, again, thank you to our speakers and uh, to the rest of my group who have helped organise all of this. Um, uh, yes, so um, thank you very much and uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for organising this. Yeah, echo that. Thank you very much. Cheers, bye. <laughs> We'd also like to call out before everyone leaves, we've had a very, very good turnout from... Rizal Technological University in Philippines. Uh, I think I need to definitely get on to whoever's managed to spread that into the uh, into to the Philippines. Uh, we've got, had a big turnout, so that's been great. <laughs> Thanks for coming along, guys. <laughs> We'll probably stop the recording there as well. A good call, Toby. Thank you for reminding me. Before we start chatting. <laughs> yeah.